Where we left off in the biblical narrative, the northern kingdom of Israel has been destroyed and a significant number of its population, uh, most likely males, uh, leadership level um, involved in the military, perhaps in crafts, have been taken off to exile in Assyria. There still remains the southern kingdom known as Judah that will retain some degree of self-governance between the years that it is invaded by King Sennacherib in the year 701 before the Common Era until it will be invaded by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586. So let's turn now to the south and try to understand what happened to Judah in these crucial years between the uh, Assyrian invasion and later the Babylonian invasion. So the king that is responsible for invading Judah at this point is Sennacherib. Uh, he ruled from the year 705 to the year 681, and 701 is the key year for his invasion of Judah. The invasion is actually recorded not only in the Bible, in the Book of Kings, but also in the monumental records of the Assyrians, a number of prisms, such as this one shown here, the Jerusalem prism, that specifically mentions the siege of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem itself was not destroyed. Destroyed. That is not a fate uh, that was met by Lachish, a nearby major city in Israel that was completely devastated by Sancherib. And here you can see in uh, Assyrian records a series of Jews who were taken captive in Lachish and uh, brought before the king to uh, show their obeisance, just giving you a sense of what it must have been like to have been conquered by Sancherib at the time. Judah prepares for the onslaught under King Hezekiah, Hezekiah by creating a, a number of uh, defenses, which ultimately would not be successful, but fascinatingly uh, constructing a new or perhaps improved secure water supply. Because Jerusalem is on a mountaintop, it has uh, some natural defenses based on the geography, but it's also at a loss in the case of a siege, which was something that happened to Jerusalem uh, multiple times throughout its millennial history. And so uh, King Hezekiah creates a new water uh, diversion aqueduct. It may have been a renovation of an earlier one, but it was found in the 19th century, uh, the Siloam tunnels that allowed the inhabitants of Jerusalem to last a little longer in these terrible sieges that would occur. At any rate, this is the status of Jerusalem, invaded and dominated by Sancherib, uh, but not necessarily destroyed outright as we saw in the northern kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of Judah retains a level of self-government and owes vassalage to Sancherib, meaning uh, paying tribute and taxes and some humiliating rituals as well. But nevertheless, Judah manages to retain some kind of political independence, at least at some level, between the year 701 and 586 when the Babylonians would destroy it. This is a golden age for prophecy in Judah. There's a tremendous number of prophets who are active at the time and whose uh, sayings and teachings were recorded in the Hebrew Bible. Two of the most famous are Isaiah, Yeshayahu in Hebrew, uh, who is shown here in this remarkable uh, uh, ceiling painting by Tiepolo that shows a famous scene at the right at the beginning of the book of Isaiah where an angel burns Isaiah's mouth because he speaks poorly of his compatriots. Uh, and this is kind of like an interesting dynamic that happens among the prophets. Some of them are like royal prophets that speak directly to kings and appear to be somehow associated with the court of kings to put them on the straight and narrow. And others seem to be like just you know, popular wandering teachers who uh, inform the population of uh, their wrongdoings and of their uh, their need to repent and so on. Uh, there are a huge number of barely named prophets in the Bible and the allusion to much larger groups who have no name whatsoever. Prophecy seems to have been some kind of like moral enterprise that uh, was very, very common in Judah. Isaiah is among the most famous of them. Also note in this interesting uh, painting that um, he's holding open a codex, an early book. Highly unlikely he would have a book in this form. More likely it would be a scroll. But also unlikely is it 
the author's attempt to perhaps draw Paleo-Hebrew characters. Uh, that is the earliest Hebrew alphabet that we have from this period. It's actually gibberish. It, those are not letters at all. Other artists, such as Raphael shown here, portrayed Isaiah more accurately, at least in terms of his Hebrew literacy. Uh, this particular painting, which has Greek on the top and a very Christological kind of reference, uh, and some uh, carefully placed um, you know, little white blocks with titles in them. And uh, you can see he's holding up a scroll, which actually has, in Hebrew, uh, a passage from the book of Isaiah. It is uh, slightly strangely written, like the spaces between the words are, are not well defined. And if you look at the first word there, it says pischu, which means open up. But the final letter is written just a little bit wrong. It looks a little bit like a resh, which is a nonsense word. But nevertheless, at least there's a much greater attempt here. I'm quite fascinated with who exactly wrote this Hebrew. Um, was it someone imitating a Hebrew script? Uh, was it someone who was personally knowledgeable, a scribe? I don't know. But at any rate, uh, you can see that there are more attempts to, to make a more, uh, you know, greater fidelity to the Hebrew original. Also, prophets like Jeremiah who uh, prophesied for several decades at the very end of the period that we're describing today. And uh, it's kind of like alternating between speaking to kings and speaking to the broader population. Not an especially well-liked man because, you know, these prophets are bringing along messages of doom and at the same time demanding that everyone repent, everyone give up their false idols, and of course there, there's quite a bit of idolatry going on in Israel at the time with very limited success. And after all, Jeremiah was doomed to witness the Babylonian exile itself, which we're going to discuss uh, in, in the next video. So this is a period of tremendous activity of the prophets, uh, giving us biblical texts of phenomenal power and resonance. Uh, it is possible that the, the texts themselves were not at all written down in this period. Um, that is, the let's say, the 8th century and the 7th century before the Common Era, the, uh, the early 6th century, but they were memorized and later actually codified into the texts we have in the later Persian period that we'll speak about in a little while um, by the students and the schools of these prophets um, as they strove to solidify the teachings of their predecessors. Uh, you see this especially because some of the books, Isaiah and Jeremiah in particular, seem disjointed and out of sync with uh, historical political elements. And uh, many recent readers have suggested that perhaps they were kind of composed like greatest hits of Jeremiah, uh, rather than composing them in a chronological sequence to fit with the uh, national political issues of the day. Rearranging the book actually makes it much easier to understand Jeremiah's life in a biographic form, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, it is also worthy of note that you see that the prophets in Judah played a national role in the sense that they spoke to major geopolitical events. And at the same time, they're very much focused on on the ground basic morality and decency and conduct and wrote about that or spoke about that in very, very sharp terms powerful readings for the contemporary era, had a phenomenal impact on the development of Jewish thought over the millennia. One of the persons who was most deeply affected, perhaps, is one of the last kings of Judah, uh, known as Josiah, or in Hebrew, Yoshiyahu. A fascinating backstory. He was um, you know, kind of secluded as a child, became king at a very young age, and very sincere kind of individual. And at one point, he was moved to renovate the uh, grounds of the temple, and they found, this is described in the book of Kings 2, chapter 22, they found in the temple a book. Some commentators think it was the full Torah, which is kind of strange, given like what was it doing until now. Uh, others say it was just the fifth book of Deuteronomy, uh, which is 
also called Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, because it goes back and kind of summarizes many of the main um, ethical precepts or mitzvot commandments of the earlier four books. But uh, Josiah says, okay, let, let's hear what does the book say? And the book is opened, uh, according to the rabbinic teachings, to a passage that is one of the most horrible set of curses in the entire Torah, the Tochacha, which uh, describes how the Jews will be punished for their idolatry and so on. And Josiah, realizing how far they have strayed from the teachings of the Torah, he tears his cloak in, in mourning, right? This is a, a basic mourning ritual. And he institutes a wide-ranging series of reforms in Judah to try and get it on the straight and narrow. This is also something we see in the biblical text that, you know, especially in the book of Kings as opposed to the book of Chronicles, there's like sort of like a, a, an epitaph for every king. This was a good king. He did what God wanted. This was a bad king. He strayed from the word of God. Back and forth is kind of oscillation and tends to be more black and white, although some of the kings are decidedly mixed in their approaches. But King Yoshiahu is clearly one of the good ones who comes bringing the Jews back towards the the old-time faith of Judaism, as it were. He also was a very successful military leader, and as you can see, uh, he took advantage of some of the major tensions between Assyria and Egypt and actually uh, struck out to the north and expanded the territory of Judah into the region of Israel. Unfortunately, he died in these battles, and Judah could not hold on to this territory. Now, I want to just turn to one last thing from this period that I find absolutely fascinating. You know, I have given you a fairly standard, traditional treatment of the ancient history of the Jews, uh, and I have qualified that from time to time uh, in the light of contemporary scholarship that sort of tries to thread the needle between maximalists, who basically take the Bible exactly at its word for specific historic events, and that the Bible strives for historicity, meaning it strives to describe in factual terms that we understand today, rather than, let's say, poetic terms or, um, or, or other uh, deviations from what we might consider the chronological record. Uh, and on the other hand, the minimalists who say, hey, the archaeological record is so thin how can you even assume that any of this happened? You know, we saw earlier that, you know, the golden era of the United Monarchy of uh, Saul, David, and Solomon leaves hardly a trace in the archaeological record. You know, you have the Tel Dan Stele, which is 150 years later. You have uh, the, the House of David existed, but what exactly was that? So many historians have opted to consider everything before the Omerides in, in the ninth century basically fiction. And it's a kind, in my humble opinion, it's a little bit of an intellectual hubris to say that simply because they have not found any evidence other than the biblical text to prove that X, Y, or Z happened, I'm going to assume it's not true. That is, uh, you know, it, it's not a, a mathematically conservative position. It is an overreach and denying the value of the Bible as a historical source. So what, why I'm saying this to you now is because occasionally you, you, is because occasionally archaeologists discover a tiny little thread that connects us to the past in such a powerful way that hammers home the idea that, oh my gosh, this actually happened. This is real. And every single discovery makes a huge difference. Have a look at this one. This is fantastic. This is a parking lot in Jerusalem, or a former parking lot in Jerusalem. As you can imagine, in the holy city, there is a tremendous amount of archaeological work going on. And so this parking lot was discovered to uh, actually be set on top of a major archaeological site. So in 2019, a dig at this site discovered an amazing thing. This bulla, which is essentially a kind of a stamp that would be used on clay, says uh, it belongs to Natan Melech, servant of the king. Okay, very interesting. And if you look at the second book of Kings, chapter 2311, we see that King Yoshiahu had a servant who was named, once in the Bible, named Natan Melech. So it's exactly the right name, found in exactly the right place, and helps us confirm 
the validity of the Bible as a historical source. Fascinating. I love when we find things like this. At any rate, the story will not end well at the end of this lecture because the Babylonian Empire is going to take over from Assyria and they are going to invade Israel as well. This invasion occurs at the beginning of the 6th century before the Common Era, and that's when we have the next great exile of the Jews, this time primarily from Judah to Babylon, and that's where we'll pick up the story in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.